Let me just make sure this is live. I'm looking at the website real quick. Okay. Oh, looks like there was an error. Hold on. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead, Patrick. All right. Well, I'm assuming that the cyber audience out there can hear me. Um, greetings, ONPS members and friends. Welcome to our second webinar, our virtual meetings in these pandemic days. Um, this is the November ONPS lecture series. Tonight's uh, lecture will be given by Dr. Richard Lapia, who is the assistant director and head curator of the Sam Noble Museum at the University of Oklahoma. He'll be talking about the paleobotany of our Oklahoma plants extending back literally millions of years ago. Lots to cover. Um, at the end of this uh, presentation, the audience will have the opportunity to submit questions before we shut it down. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Lapia, just write them down and submit them. Adam is our webmaster and will be coordinating at the end of it. And we'll go from there. Dr. Lapia, on behalf of the Oklahoma Native Plant Society, thank you for taking the time to give this presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, inviting me. Uh, welcome uh, to a lecture on the greening of the earth. Um, as he said, I'm assist, uh, associate director of the museum, uh, curator of paleobotany and micropaleo and associate professor at the School of Geosciences at the university, so I have a joint appointment. Um, I know, so to explain the date, this kind of feels to me as the 257th day of March. <coughs> so that's why it says that. So we'll begin. So land plants um, have been around for about 465 million years or about one-tenth of the age of the earth. Um, this puts the first fossil plants date back to the Ordovician period. Um, this is, the Ordovician is actually apparent here in Oklahoma, not from terrestrial fossils or even terrestrial rocks, but from uh, a large majority of the limestones you see as you go from Oklahoma City down to Dallas, passing through the Arbuckles, much of that is Ordovician limestone, or uh, Oklahoma was, for most of this early period, <coughs> underwater. And our record of these early plants come um, from around the world, just not from Oklahoma. And that record are not these sort of canonical leaf fossils, but rather spores, such as you see here. These spores provide the earliest evidence they're made, one of the features that define land plants is that they have these spores and they're made from a chemical uh, somewhat uncreatively named sporopollenin um, that is exceedingly resistant to acid degradation. Um, so it can be in wet sediment, generally acids coming out of um, uh, decaying and decomposing plants that actually favors the preservation of plant material and these spores. However, these spores, if you were to put them in sort of household bleach, they'd be gone in under 30 minutes. So it's really about the chemistry of the rocks that enables these to be preserved. The first fossils are sort of not very exciting. Very small plants on the order of a few centimeters in height. Um, they're Simple, they have no leaves. These plants have no leaves, no roots, no vascular system. They're not transporting water up and sugar uh, down. But <clears throat> the earliest plants, and these are some of the earliest macro fossils, Cooksonia, from the upper Silurian, um, are actually somewhat what botanists call derived. They have more advanced features than we expect of the earliest plants that would have appeared on land. And the earliest plants we would expect to appear on land are more of the uh, type of bryophytes, mosses, hornworts, and liverworts, which have uh, very short, for the most part, short stalks, 
but they're all characterized in the spore producing phase of their life cycle as having unbranched sporophytes. And so these early plants that as they appear in the fossil record are remarkably because they're branched. And so one stock becomes two, two, four, four, eight, and so on. And this is a proliferation of the production of spores. This allows these plants to spread out, produce more propagules and spread out and cover a landscape. And where we have uh, evidence of flooding and sort of instantaneous burial, we see whole surfaces of rocks covered by the, these plants. They grew rhizomatously in very patchy distributions, the same species, actually the same plant growing out, but again, only to about three to four centimeters. Um, in this period of time, it would be exceptional to be up even close to 10 centimeters. Nevertheless, this greening of the earth in the Ordovician and Silurian has been implicated by some scientists as having an effect on climate already. So even the plants were small during this mid-Ordovician mid period here, middle to late, we see cooling. The hypothesis is as rocks weather, as the, the, these plants don't have roots, they're, but they're nevertheless secreting acids that help dissolve rocks. This increases the weathering, the breakdown of rocks to such an extent that CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. Removing CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, would have the effect of cooling the planet. And indeed, the end of the Ordovician, the late Ordovician, is a very brief um, ice age at this time. And so there's a, this correlation in time postulated to be uh, affected through the weathering of rocks as these plants sort of hang on to the substrate and derive their nutrients to have an effect on climate even at the size of just a few centimeters. But the record of plants, the fossil record of plants really takes off and we see an di incredible diversification of form in the Devonian um, about 375 million years ago and comes from Liney in Scotland. You can see the top, it's a nice little hamlet. And the outcrop, such as it is, is actually that field in the bottom. Um, there's no cliffs, there's no spectacular cliffs. These are rocks that broken up, have been broken up by weathering or tilling of the soil here and float to the surface as rain washes away some of the dirt. And we find these little blocks. And this was discovered in the, uh, 20s and described in the 30s. But what went, when they looked at these rocks, what they saw were chert, silicified stems and um, axes in this chert. And so everything you see here, all of these, if you can see my arrow, these are the stems here. Here's a cross section of the stem. And you can actually see here is one horizon, one growth surface. The plants started growing up and then they were buried and another horizon of plant growth started to grow up on top of that. And so because it's a chert preserved in quartz, you can serially section, cut them, polish them to basically translucency and in identify the structures. And, one of the, and you can follow this through the block and reconstruct the three-dimensional appearance of these plants. In doing that, here's this is aglophyton as you would see it on the surface of a rock. And here is the reconstruction of it. Again, rhizomatously, uh, horizontal stems growing out. Some of them branch and grow upward, all of them ending in, in sporangia. And the preservation is such, here's a cross section of the stem. And here down here is a cross section of the rhizome showing these rhizoids, these sort of single cell outgrowths of the epidermis that acted like, they weren't structurally roots, but they acted like roots. And it's this level of organization that nevertheless, by virtue of their abundance, is proposed to have this strong effect on weathering and of climate. 
Here's another, this is a more complicated plant. This is actually probably the tallest plant in this assemblage, Asteroxylon, named for the star-shaped vascular system. So there are vascular plants now in this floor. In, in other words, moving water up, up and sugars down. Um, and again, you can see the cellular structure. This is a close-up of the tracheids with the lignified thickenings that characterize um, primary xylem or the first xylem in the plants. But even as they are the tallest plants, and we have the Asteroxon, which is again, uh, one of the shorter plants, this assemblage by looking at a lot of these cherts, sectioning these in intense, uh, uh, and studying them in intense detail, the flora of this site is actually very rich. So you have plants that we interpret as gametophytes um, that produce sperm and egg, sporophytes that produce spores. I showed you Asteroxylon, Megalophyton here, but also algae, fungi, cyanobacteria, some lichens, and this enigmatic um, structure could be called nematophyton. So this is a very, very diverse community here in the Devonian, in the early Devonian, but again, fairly short. Agamophyton is up to 15, so we've gone from two to three, maybe 10, in the Silurian up to uh, 15, 20, and the Asteroxylon being the tallest at 40. So this is not a very tall, we don't have forests yet, we don't have, um, we have ground cover. But that's not to say there weren't very large organisms. Here's one of these orga organisms that were common in these early to middle Devonian plants uh, 375, 380 million years ago. And here's sort of ed on, end on view of a plant um, we call Prototaxites. And it's not wood, although that it bears the name of Taxus. It's most, excuse me, it's most in, commonly interpreted, the general but not complete consensus, is that these are fungal structures. These are uh, fungi that achieve this great height towering over um, the vegetation at this time. Um, we don't have any spores, we don't have any um, uh, evidence to show that these were like mushrooms or or anything that producing uh, reproductive structures. So it raises the question of why they're 17 feet tall. Um, but nevertheless, we find these often in life position buried in the rocks. The vegetation at this time, I, as I said, is largely along river systems um, based on the relationships, the inferred relationships for early terrestrial plants. Uh, we believe that these, they came through uh, freshwater systems that are most closely related to green algae. And so they occupy the very wet, damp habitats along river courses. So in from the coast, but not occupying mountains. The mountains would have been largely, we assume, largely bare, deserts, of course, very bare, and too far from the rivers where there isn't this sort of abundant moisture also still being bare at this time. Um, in the next five to 10 million years ago, we actually start to, uh, to see trees in the fossil record, um, several getting up fairly high. Here's Pseudobornia at nine meters. It's inferred to be a relative of horsetails of Equisetum. Uh, Rachophyton is a, a fern relative, interpreted as a fern relative. So we're getting height, but right at the end of the Devonian, in the uh, late Devonian, we have actually the first Oklahoma plant fossils in the form of Archaeopteryx um, when it's a leaf and the wood is known as Calyxylon. This is the, the stump that you see at the um, University in Ada. Uh, very large, totally, um, this is wood. Uh, you could cut it, saw it, make a ship and house out of it, um, but not seed. This is not a seed plant. It is still producing spores, despite a height that in these plants, 
would have reached upwards of 30 meters tall. So we have now by the end of the Devonian at about 360 or so million years ago, we have a tall canopy and we have ground cover, the beginning of a modern forest. And here is a reconstruction that you can see at the Sam Noble Museum. All of these large trees are Calyxalon, Archaeopteris. Um, Rachophyton is shown here. Here's a smaller Archaeopteryx. And beneath this, lest you think I'm only talking about plants, um, you have the first vertebrates appear on land, the first four-footed tetrapods that appear on land, Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, which are both known from the late Devonian of Greenland. In this time, we have the first seed plants um, appearing in the fossil record. So we have the evolution of seeds sometime in the Devonian, but they aren't trees. None of them have accomplished trees. At best, they're these tiny little uh, ground cover uh, herbs, maybe becoming sort of vines. Some people have interpreted them as sort of the first vines um, winding the way up the tree here. Um, but with that, with the evolution of seeds in the Devonian, we have the plants now have the potential to move away, not being tied as much to water and occupying um, highlands or at least drier land, seasonally dry to ever dry soils. In terms of the vegetation, not only do we get trees shown here, this top shows the height in centimeters um, through the early, uh, late, uh, late Silurian and Devonian, up when we get in Devonian, and then finally to the late Devonian um, here with the very tall trees up around 30 meters. But as trees are going up, they're also going down and we see an increase in the depth at which plant roots are now penetrating the ground. This is accelerating weathering. This is, um, which would remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But for a variety of reasons, we also see at this time the onset of glaciation. So all of the CO2 that they're removing is not enough to overcome um, other drivers that are moving earth into what we call the late Paleozoic Ice Age. This ice age began um, in the late Devonian, um, was interrupted by a warm period and took over again in the Carboniferous, extending through the Carboniferous into the early Permian. So somewhere around 360 to about 270, 260 million years ago, nearly a hundred million year long ice age, never fully covered the earth, although that happened in the much more distant past, um, but centered in the South Hemisphere in which there are massive continental scale glaciers. We'll skip through the early Carboniferous and we come to the Pennsylvanian. This was the time of Pangaea, all Earth, the continents, um, except for parts here of China, are all together. You see the glaciation occupying the Southern continent, uh, Gondwana. Here's North America. We would be sitting right here, pointing to the Wachita Mountains, right in here. This gives rise in Oklahoma to, this is the time in Oklahoma of all of the coals, all of the coal deposits that occupy um, and have been mined here in Oklahoma. This coal realm or coal province extends equatorially along the Appalachians through Illinois, Alabama, and then continuing across into what is now England. And that reflects this tropical climate. All of these green dots represent coal deposits from this period of the late Carboniferous. North and south of that, right about the latitudes today, about you know, 25, 28, 30 degrees north and south of the equator, we have a desert belt. This is driven by um, atmospheric cycles. Um, cycling of the atmosphere, what we call Hadley and feral cells. Um, but 
So this was a very tightly constrained, constrained ever wet region that gave rise to this very important coal that gave itself gave rise and fuel literally the industrial revolution. In Oklahoma, much of that coal, upwards of 70% of some of those coal seams here in Oklahoma are the bark of these groups of pleat trees, these very tall trees here on the right of your screen um, that belong to a group we call lycopsids. On the left are living species in three main groups, like Pedialis, Selaginellias, and Isotales. Um, these very tall trees, which again themselves are up to about 40, 50 meters tall in the Carboniferous, their modern, their closest modern relative among these is this Isoetes. So now the closest living relative of these, you know, approaching 200 foot tall trees is about six to uh, 12 centimeters in height. But these trees are incredibly important. <clears throat> they dominate the swamps. They're taller than almost all of the other trees in the swamp. And so they would have poked through the canopy as what we call emergence through the canopy. Some of them produced spores. These, are, these do not produce seeds. They're not closely related to seed plants. They're actually a deep division in land plants, um, like hopsids on one side, and then ferns and seed plants on the other. But <clears throat> they grew, many of them, not all, but many of them grew, grow, growing up sort of a shaggy telephone poles that have sort of grass-like leaves that come off, and then reproducing all at once at the end of these branches. So these branches at the top of your screen are cones, and some of these cones would have been over uh, 12 inches long. And you can literally find when these broadcast their um, spores, you can find beds in the coal that are nothing but uh, quarter inch, half inch thick layers of these spores that were all shed by these trees nearly simultaneously and covered the whole coal swamp. They were very well adapted to water, although they're not close, like I said, not closely related to seed plants. They did evolve structures that were very similar to seeds and use those structures to float their propagules, their spores out across the water to distribute them. Beneath these would have been a canopy of ferns. Um, this is one of the earliest modern type ferns. These are Moradialian tree ferns. Um, they're still alive today, shown on the left, um, characteristic of the Southern hemisphere um, today. <coughs> and then here's a reconstruction of a taxon we call Seronius from the Carboniferous very similar in structure. Um, horsetails, modern horsetails at the top, and then fossil horsetails here in the Carboniferous represented by Annularian astrophytes. So very good, very obvious leaves in a highly fractal tree here. I should point out that among these groups, um, lycopsids, here and horsetails independently evolved secondary xylem. They independently evolved wood. Um, the very tall trees that are the lycopsids actually had much less wood. Um, if you were to go up, you know, 30 or 40 feet in the lycopsid tree, the amount of wood would have been a cylinder maybe four or five inches in diameter. Whereas these calamites, calamites um, that reached about 50 feet in height, they would have had, you know, foot, foot and a half, two feet diameter wood. Um, very similar in structure to the wood of seed plants, but independently evolved. And then we have seed ferns. These are so named, they're, they're a very broad assemblage of plants that have, that other than having seeds are not particularly closely related to each other, but they're lumped together as seed ferns because they retain 
the foliage of that are, have the form of ferns. Um, they even have croziers, the fiddleheads at the top of these trees as the fronds unfurled, but they produce seeds and they come in a bewildering number and variety of different leaf types. This is a centimeter for scale. Their leaves are impressive. They're actually not all, they're unlike the tree ferns and calamites, might, which might be about 40 or 50 feet high, these trees, and we have them from storm deposits so we can see the whole tree, are about 20 or so feet, uh, 25 feet high. With leaves, there's one leaf in the center, that line is a one meter bar. So this was a 14 to 15 foot leaf um, that grew out of this tree and was, would have, some of them appear to have rotted on the tree, hung down like palm leaf, dried palm leaves, and some broke up and shattered. As you might expect with a single leaf that is um, 15 feet long and nine feet across, these are very abundant in the fossil record. They shed a lot of their pinnules um, shown on the right of your screen. So in this carboniferous swamp and the forest and the vegetation outside of the swamp on the drier lands around it, we have a canopy of tree ferns and horsetails. We have the vegetation, the emergent vegetation um, in the form of lycopsids that sort of blow through the canopy and go up uh, another hundred or so feet. We have these medullosins, these seed ferns that are a sub canopy. We still have ground cover ferns. And to top off this structure, which is very, very modern, almost nothing alive is the same as it would be today in a modern forest system, um, except for those radialian tree ferns. Um, nothing at the genus or species level is alive today. All of the major types of plants are present in the Carboniferous. So by 300 million years ago, we have a very modern aspect forest with all of the layers, um, but none of the same players. And the last component, if you think of sort of, um, at least how movies portray forests, the one thing I haven't mentioned yet are vines. Yet in the Carboniferous, we have good evidence of vines. Um, here's a taxon we call Pseudomeriopterus. Here is an actual leaf cuticle that has been lifted from the rock, dissolve away the rock, and this stem and leaves remain. And we can actually find these, trace these remains out, and find they terminate with modified leaves as hooks that hang on to the branches and the bark of the tree or sort of are swollen. They look like suckers, but they would probably have uh, grown into a crack and then swelled and act as anchor so they couldn't pull away. So 300 million years ago, we have a very modern aspect forest with totally different players. Another very interesting component of the Carboniferous are seeds, these seed ferns produced a very large variety of seeds and a very large variety of sizes of seeds. So here's on the right is the Phanospermum. This is a centimeter for scale. Um, so you have something on the order of 10 millimeters. And the largest is a taxon we call Trigonocarpus is 11 centimeters long. It is the largest seed known from the fossil record until flowering plants take over after the KT or KPG, Cretaceous Tertiary, uh, now Cretaceous Paleogene boundary event at 65 million years. So from about 300 million years until 55 or so million years, this was the largest seed. Nothing else approached this size. We have some cycad seeds from the Jurassic that are on the order of uh, five to six centimeters in diameter, but nothing this large. And we have conifers and cordites. These are cordites um, occupying very tall trees, um, seed plants that produce wood, closely related to conifers. 
It's been speculated that there's mangrove form, that these were occupying coastal habitats and had prop roots, although we haven't actually found those prop roots, and a shrubby form, a low growing, sort of almost uh, scrambling ground cover form of these with these strap-like leaves. So these plant groups, again, not only had a modern forest structure, but also displayed the same sort of finicky soil preferences um, that we see in many types of plants today. And each of these groups had a character, characteristic uh, affinity for certain types of soils. The Lycopsids in general preferred wet soils. Um, the seed plants um, and the horsetails relatives, the Calamites occupied drier parts of the habitat. And so we had this very sort of um, differentiated forest structure with here's the Lycopsids in the river, here's an uh, island bar in the middle of the river with dominated by Lycopsids, and then you have tree ferns, cordites over here, and horsetails over here occupying the sort of higher ground. And they were very, very faithful to these environments, to these habitats through most of the 20 or so million years of the late Carboniferous until finally they were pressured and pushed by climate change. There was a series of episodic drying events in the late Carboniferous, um, event one bigger than the next one, bigger than the previous, um, until a, in the late Carboniferous, just before the end of the Carboniferous, an extinction event takes out almost all of these Lycopsids. The Lycopsids are basically gone in North America. They do survive in China. But as North America moved off of the equator, um, moved north in the case of North America, um, it dried out, it entered that arid belt. And the Lycopsids, which were very committed to these wet habitats and had evolved adaptations to grow and to disperse their spores in the wet habitats, they were basically, they went extinct. There was one genus that survived into the Permian in North America, and it was the one that occupied the very driest edge of the swamp that we never saw in the very wettest sort of ever flooded components or regions of the swamp. They were way up here with all of these seed plants, and that was its preference. And so when the dry event came in, the climate change came in, they actually survived. And as I mentioned earlier, the Carboniferous is known, is named Carboniferous, literally carbon bearing or coal bearing. Um, that's a characteristic of this interval. And in order to have that coal, you had to bury the plants. The plants had to be buried. But when they're buried, that carbon, all of the, that plant debris couldn't decompose. And so here's the equation water plus carbon dioxide gives us sugar and oxygen. That's the process of photosynthesis, but respiration or decomposition takes those sugars and oxygen and returns C uh, water and CO2. And normally this is approximately balanced with a little favoring of oxygen that builds up in the atmosphere. Um, but in the Carboniferous, during the Carboniferous, so much of these sugars in the form of the actual plant were buried, basically removed and not allowed to decompose, that this balance was upset. And we see a rise, a profound rise in oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. So here's the dotted line is present at atmospheric level, about 21%. Um, through most of the Carboniferous, it's hanging out right in that region. Uh, excuse me, through most of the Phanerozoic, this last 600 million years, it's hanging out right around present day levels and then rises sharply right in this late, late Devonian through Carboniferous into the early Permian times. How high? Upwards of 30%. Some models say 35, although most modern, most recent models have lowered that to about 30. We know, for instance, it probably never got to 40 because we don't 
if at 40% uh, oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, static would ignite a forest fire. Lightning would ignite, would ignite a forest fire. So it could never have gotten that high. We don't see these evidence in the form of charcoal of these massive conflagrations. We have occasional layers in the coal and in, in beds of charcoal, and I'll come back to that later, um, but we never see this massive amount. So we know oxygen drift up high, but this rise in oxygen had profound effects or offered profound opportunities is perhaps a better way of saying it. And animals took advantage of it. And then during the Carboniferous and early Permian, we gave rise to giant dragonflies. Um, here's a reconstruction of one at the, the museum. And the scale, a single wing is 29 inches long. So these had two wings. So they're over two feet long, one ring. There's two, one wing, there's two wings. So you mount to about um, four feet across. And modern one is only about five centimeters. Oh, sorry, sorry, I apologize. They're five, they're about a foot across and the overall width of the whole organism is 29 compared to the largest five today. They're not the only organisms that we see getting very large, gigantism. We see um, centipede and millipede relatives called Arthropleura approaching six feet long. Um, we have portions of their, their exoskeleton preserved, as well as trackways preserved that are about a foot or so across, attesting to their giant size. Of course, in Oklahoma, after the coals of the eastern part of Oklahoma, which continued to the west but are buried under younger rocks, we have the red beds of the Permian. And so you keep, see here, Oklahoma would have been occupying right about here. We've drifted, North America has drifted north of the equator. And we see this thinning and loss of the coals in the bottom right here. There's a very narrow wet area primarily uh, right along the coast as sea level rises and falls, but a very dry Pangaea, very dry continent. Um, and this gives rise to the wet, the, the dry floors and the red beds of Oklahoma. And a lot of the vertebrates that we see come from this. Amid these plants, such as Teneopterus, Gigantopterus, um, here's Gigantopterus down in the bottom right, here's Teneopterus up here. Um, we have Dimetrodon, Adaphosaurus, Uriops, a, a very large vertebrate fauna um, as well. Coming into the Triassic, we have very little Triassic preserved in Oklahoma, primarily up in the Panhandle. Uh, North America and the rest begins to sp split away from uh, Pangaea in, in the late Triassic, um, but the early Triassic is very arid, um, very dry. So we don't have these wet river systems that give us a very large fossil record generally need water to move the sediment that buries plants. And so it's really missing. Continuing on into the, the Jurassic, towards the late Jurassic, we get increase in the record, um, but because of the climate, which tends to be um, relatively dry overall, there's wet periods in it. Um, we equally don't have uh, fauna that's a uh, floor that's very abundant in the Oklahoma rock record. I just had a student complete his PhD in which he described um, some of the earliest fossil woods, petrified wood from the panhandle of Oklahoma, finding three different genera of plants, of trees out there. Um, nor Jurassic's moving farther north, still fairly dry as you can see here, this is sort of time average and still put together, we don't have it. Um, as it splits up, we get a more maritime, a more equitable, wetter climate um, spreading across North America and Oklahoma until we come to the, oh, here's Jurassic, sorry. Until we come to the Cretaceous 
And this gives rise to a very sort of modern aspect. The continents are nearly in their positions, um, shown here from the map from 94 million years ago. Um, North America has separated, Africa and South America have separated. The, there's a young Atlantic. The sea is very high at this time because of the plates moving across. So the oceans are relatively shallow and they displace their water. North America is split um, intermittently. The, the seaway that splits North America comes and goes through the Cretaceous. And we have much wetter, much, in Oklahoma, we have coastal climates um, preserved in southeastern Oklahoma, as well as up in the panhandle of Oklahoma. But what the Cretaceous gives us, and for the first time we see in the rock record, everything I've mentioned, the plants that I mentioned, many of those ferns have gone away. We get a new group of ferns. We have conifers. They diversify. Ginkgos and cycads appear in the, in the uh, Triassic and Permian, respectively. But what we're missing are flowering plants. The Cretaceous, now we see here the origination, at least in the fossil record, of flowering plants. plants plant, these flowering plants um, appear first in low latitudes and spread northward. Um, they take time, they take about 10 million years to move from the equator to or towards both poles. And we see a lot of diversification. And so for the first time, we expect, from the, um, on Earth, we see color. We see a massive amount of color. Judging by the vegetation, um, excluding flowering plants, there's not a lot of colors, some yellow, some orange, but we don't see the vibrant blues and reds. And this color, both in the visual spectrum and in the ultraviolet spectrum that insects can see is fundamentally related to animals, to animal dispersing, animal pollination, whether it be birds, um, which appear in the Lake Cretaceous, or insects um, drive or appear to drive the diversification of flowering plants. For a long time in the rock record, we knew magnolias shown up in the top here um, were the characteristic Cretaceous fossil flower. And if you think about it, it's a large flower and it's very easy to preserve. If you have something the size of a dinner plate, it's easy to spot when you're splitting rocks. And then about in the 1980s, in the early 80s, someone came up with the idea, actually um, Anne Scarby and Elsa Marie Fries in Sweden, came up with the idea of instead of splitting rocks and looking for you know, big things we can see, let's sieve, let's take the rock, break it down with soap and water, put it through a sieve, shake it and see what doesn't go through the sieve. And what they found were very tiny, small charcoalified flowers coming back to the wildfires. So these are flowers um, related to Ericalians, blueberry family, um, structures where you have the uh, sepals, in this case with nectaries, around petals, and we dissect those away and we find the anthers and the stigma and style. And many times we can break open the ovary and we can see the ovules inside. So we have all, almost cellular level, and we can resolve in some cases, cellular level structures with the pollen in these um, from numerous localities uh, in North America, in Europe, and in Japan. And these are all spread across most of the productive fossil the localities are spread in the temperate zone in what is now or what would in the Cretaceous have been the temperate zone. And this makes sense because we need that seasonal dryness to fuel the wildfires that created the charcoal that preserved these. Um, but still enough vegetation, excuse me, enough um, moisture to support very diverse florists. And so we see in the early Cretaceous, we don't have any flowering plants. We still don't have any good evidence of flowering plants. There's molecular data, um, DNA data that suggests that flowering plants were on the landscape somewhere in 
the very early Cretaceous, but we haven't found them yet. Um, by about 120, 125 million years ago, we have the first evidence. And then they spread very rapidly through the Cretaceous, um, expanding their roles, expanding their coverage of the continents in all directions and in all continents um, until we get to a modern flora that we have today. And one of the reasons for this is the insects and the birds, the animals, um, flowering plants are in general exceptionally good at manipulating animals to do what they want. Um, you can think of orchids, um, figs, um, lots of different plants, even simple plants, arrange their petals to attract insects and birds. But they also have other features. And one of the things plant, flowering plants did is during this time, as the Cretaceous goes on, CO2 is actually dropping in the atmosphere. It's declining through time. It's cooling off. The Cretaceous has a warm period, but it cools off toward, through the Cretaceous, CO2 drops, and plants have to become very efficient at using water. And so if we look at the leaves of flowering plants, we see that this level of or this density of venation in those leaves in flowering plants far exceeds those of any other type of plants on the landscape. So here's a plot, this is from Boyce et al. Um, the blue are flowering plants, the bottom down here are the blue, the red are the other plants, and this is reflecting the density of venation from ginkgo biloba, which is very parallel veins that have a very low density, all the way up to some types of angiosperms that are very much higher. Um, we know that there are a few groups, Nitales, Gigantopterdales, and um, Fern, that do achieve this, but very, oh, by and large, flowering plants are the main group that sort of occupy this very high five to 20 uh, millimeter density. And that's related to their ability to, to move water, to provide water to all of their cells. And they need to do this because as CO2 drops, the plants have to hold their pores, their stomata open longer to get enough CO2 in. But the penalty for opening up the pores and allowing CO2 in is water comes out. It's called transpiration. And so this, has, this too has an effect. So here's a plots of South America based on what happens in terms of precipitation at the top and temperature at the bottom relative to not having flowering plants. And so these scientists ran simulations in which they repopulated the Amazon with non-flowering plants. So fern, diversity of ferns and conifers. And what they saw is it's much, much drier, shown here in red, and much, much warmer without flowering plants. So the clouds that are persist over the Amazon are in fact generated by the evaporation of water from all of the flowering plants. The plants create their own microclimate in cooling themselves off, shading them from the flower and affecting the temperature of the region. And this over the close of the globe has a profound effect. The clouds themselves operate through um, reflecting sunlight to even act more and more towards cooling the planet. So we see another case of vegetation affect the evolution of plants on land affecting vegetation, uh, changes in vegetation that themselves affect the entire world, in this case, through climate, through precipitation and temperature. Here, in Colorado, we had a tropical rainforest. This is right after the uh, demise of the dinosaurs. There were rainforests, um, very large leaves, very diverse. You can see 101 species with 90 species of flowering plants um, in Colorado at this time. Um, the record in Oklahoma fades away. We don't have uh, a terrestrial record of plants in Oklahoma, 
from uh, about the middle of, excuse me, middle of the Cretaceous, uh, around about 95 million years ago, until the record picks up again in the Miocene, in the Ogallala Formation. And here we have a very different, obviously we've jumped ahead 90 million years, and the vegetation in Oklahoma has gone from this lush, luxurious forest, this wet forest, to grasslands. Climate has changed again. It's dried out locally. And we have a different set of plants and a different set of animals. And through the Miocene in particular, we see a transition in many parts of the world at slightly different times. But in North America, we see this transition from forests and woodlands to grasslands in their various forms. And so we go from a dense forest to open grasslands. And this, ha this has effects on the animals, the dominant animals in these regions. As the animals adapt, we go from forest vegetation, such as characterized today by giraffes browsing on leaves, which have very characteristic teeth with what we call low crown, to grazers, which have very high crown teeth very deep jaw to support these very long growing teeth that are worn away from the phytoliths, the silica bodies in grass leaves and the dirt on the grass, on, uh, that are on the grass that they're eating. And we can see this um, horses in the rock record. We don't have giraffes here in, in Oklahoma, but we did have camels. We have quite a diversity of camels here in Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma fossil record. And getting on, this continues, this difference in the vegetation plays out in the plants' um, effect on where different types of, in this case, elephants live. We have mastodons with these very low crown teeth, large bumps for grinding branches and leaves that characterize the forest, and mammoths with these very high crowns teeth for cutting and slicing leaves, like a sort of you know, two dozen scissors here, grinding and clipping and chopping uh, grass leaves. We come to the cross timbers, this ancient cross region of west, uh, excuse me, eastern Oklahoma um, region. And so, we can ask why it is and where it's going, where it went. Um, but the transition, the changes in forest can also occur simply as a due to climate change through time. Here, spruce at the top, this white mass or glaciers as they retreated, we see spruce keeping up with that retreat and oaks. The oaks expanded slightly, but they didn't really keep up. They had their own climate preference um, and stayed sort of in the southeast despite the full retreat. And all of the plants have their own preferences. And so as we go back in time, unfortunately, Oklahoma's just off this map that I could find. If we start in the modern and go back 6,000 years, 9,000, we see different types of forest. And the red you see here is, is called no analog. In other words, the mixture, the combination of plants that we saw 12,000 years ago doesn't match any typical or any characteristic modern forest that we see in America, the plant in, in Eastern North America. And the plants are following their own preferences in space regarding soil type or regarding climate. And so the modern system, the modern vegetation types that we see are actually fairly recent, um, at least in terms of their spread, um, even if some, some combinations of floors can be tracked. So we have modern floors really a function of modern times and the modern system, it's not that old. And I'll end with two quick uh, examples. Um, Dan Jansen wrote a paper a long time ago about uh, neotropical anachronisms, plants whose seeds didn't match, they, they were fleshy, or they had some structures that indicated that they were eaten by animals. But of course, he was looking in Costa Rica, in 
Central America, but there were no animals large enough. And so this, this is what gave rise to the term anachronism, plants that have lost, in this case, they're dispersed because they, the animals have gone extinct and the plants had evolved to feed or to be fed on and have their seeds dispersed by these very large animals that are no longer around. They went extinct and the plants are left with this. And here's a really good book by kind of Barlow called The Ghosts of Ep on this and draws in more examples um, to expand uh, Dan Jansen's. Here in Oklahoma, we have the uh, Osage orange, the Macura palmifera. This is, if you've ever seen these, I'm, I'm sure you have, very large fruits with this obnoxious, sticky, horrible sap. Um, nothing really wants to eat them today. They're not well regarded by any animals. There's anecdotal evidence of different things such as squirrels eating them. But really for a gompothere, for a mammoth or mastodon that could swallow all of these whole and then you know digest them and come out the back end, um, they weren't really concerned with the sap. It didn't present a thing. And it was actually a way of that sap is likely to have been some sort of protection against you know small seed predators getting in and eating the seeds. Squirrels are much likely, more likely to eat small seeds. But by packaging them in this way that only a very large animal could eat, which wouldn't care about this sap, they could achieve their seed dispersal. And another is the honey locust, Gladitsia, um, with these spiraling dry, uh, when dry seed pods. In this case, these might have been preserved by, or might have been dispersed by a set of animals. But in this study, um, published in 2016, this is arguing that it, the, the modern distribution of this plant um, is best explained by usage by Native Americans um, that in this case they looked at or they asserted an argument that Cherokee settlements um, where cattle grazing was prevalent explains their distribution that this, this is an anachronistic plant that found a new dispersal agent in humans and that this was the dominant control on their current distribution. Um, obviously a very relatively in geologic time, recent control on distributions and the origin of Oklahoma plants. So with that, I will be happy to take questions. Adam, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, thank you, Rick. That was extremely um, educational. Being a botanist myself, I I don't get into the plant evolution side of things very much. But we did have um, several folks online who um, were were not necessarily commenting or asking questions, but did provide some reactions. Some with happy faces, some with thumbs up. We did have a question from Connie that said, um, oh, giant dragonflies, exclamation mark. Um, were these large invertebrates mainly herbivores? Uh, their mouth parts would suggest that they were carnivores as modern dragonflies are. So okay. there were diversity there. There's a very large insect fauna, fa fossil fauna known from um, just north of Stillwater and the beds can be followed up into uh, Kansas. And so there was quite a diversity of insects. And these are just one of, one of the types of insects, um, obviously among the rarer at that size. All right. Um, we also had another comment that said, um, Oklahoma has petrified wood, question mark. Yes, there's the most abundant petrified wood is found um, in South Central Oklahoma um, in the geologic rocks that we call the Woodford Formation. 
It's a marine shale and there are very large logs that have drifted off, floated, presumably um, rafted down rivers from what is now Arkansas out into uh, this Woodford Sea, become waterlogged and buried in these sediments. Um, the The wood, the petrified wood, um, but it's been collected rather intensely. Um, there is carboniferous petrified wood, um, a genus of fossil wood we call the doxalon, that's um, probably conifer um, in origin. There is Jurassic, we now know from my, my work, wood um, out in the panhandle, um, and some Cretaceous wood from the Cheyenne sandstone out in the panhandle as well. Um, that tends not to be preserved particularly well in terms of cellular detail, but you can find logs still lying on the surface out there, although much of it's on private land nowadays. There's a paper by Neil Sennison in Oklahoma Geology Notes about petrified wood in, in Oklahoma. That's great. Um, Jay Pruitt says, absolutely fascinating. Thanks for the talk. Um, Evelyn Friedman asks, um, you have a coal ball at the museum, question mark. What kind of seeds are in it, question mark. Um, these are seeds from largely conifers. Um, uh, Cardiocarpus is one of them. Um, and there's a large, large number of different forms of those. Some are spiny, some are smooth. Um, but those, they're um, found in these coal balls, um, various times. In, I mentioned that there's several dry periods in the Carboniferous. Um, and when the, there's a big one at the end that kills off all the lycopsids. But some of the smaller ones early on, wh where we see other evidence of drying um, and a retraction in the coal swamps, the coal swamps actually have an influx of these cordites, these, this early type of conifers. And so we get more seeds of them appearing in those, in those coal balls. We also had a comment. Um, someone mentioned they weren't aware that camels were in Oklahoma. Yeah, there's very large ca camels in Oklahoma. Um, and a uh, diversity of much smaller types. Camels actually appear in North America, along with horses. Both of these clades, this, these groups of organisms, first appeared in North America, then went extinct. And then horses were reintroduced relatively recently um, by the colonists. But camel relatives, um, you know, as the alpaca, the cunha, uh, and llama from South America. We also had a comment about um, one of the ghosts of evolution that you mentioned. Is uh, the honey locust an example of one of those as well? Yes. Um, that's smaller seeds, so it has a better distribution, um, but it also has very large seeds compared to most of the things that eat seeds. So they're not really dispersed by squirrels because they're so large, the squirrels would eat them, can get into them. Um, which isn't terribly hard once the pods dry out. Um, so any very large seed would be a high, very attractive to a seed predator, such as squirrels, but they're so large, they're easily eaten, damaged to the point that they won't germinate. And so they would have relied on something that would sort of gobble the whole pod and then you know, pass the seed without a lot of um, very damaging digestion. We've often heard, um, or at least the story's been circulated in the Native Plant Society, that the, the giant ground sloths were perhaps one of the um, large connoisseurs of the Osage Orange. Or if you're a local native Oklahoman, we call them bodarks. Bodark. Um, yeah. So can you comment on the ground sloths? That certainly is possible. They survived up until very recently. Um, I'm a deep time geologist, so, you know, 12,000 years is recent. Right. Um, yeah. But that's recent, and they, they 
certainly would would have been of the scale and size to to reach through the spines and pick them out or simply collect them from the ground below without even sort of bothering to deal with those spines. Yeah. When was the Miocene period when the animals and topography of Oklahoma changed so much? About five to ten, five to twelve million years ago. Uh, yeah. The rock record in Oklahoma is not that full interval of time, but it's about five to twelve million years ago. So the prairie state that we think of now, as far as in the the Great Plains, this evolution where we're in the short grass or the tall grass or the mixed grass prairie that we talk about, that was five to 10 million years in the making? Uh, grasses first appear in the fossil record in the late Cretaceous. They've been found in, of all places, dinosaur um, poop, coprolites officially. Um, mm -hmm. and but they, they, they never appear very abundant. Grass pollen, um, grass leaves, macrofossils never become very abundant in the fossil record until we get into the Cenozoic, until we approach the Miocene. And in North America, the transition from sort of forest to open prairie occurs during the Miocene period across North America. And it probably reflects a climate change, a drying out. Um, once you get drying out, prairies, of course, are gra a fire maintained ecosystem. So you have seasonal uh, dry season. You have dry season that allows wires, fires to spread across. That keeps that acts to keep the trees out. And grasses with their, their points of growth, the meristems, down near the ground or buried in the uh, shallowly buried would be protected from that as they go through. And of course, you know, grazing animals exacerbate this and encourage this because they chomp on the tops of the grass and, uh, but they don't affect the growth point. Right. Adam, do you have any other questions or comments? Yeah, I actually have one. Well, we have a comment from Meredith who says, uh, don't have any questions. Just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. It was fascinating. And we also have our last question from Lizzie, who asks, um, are seed ferns con considered true ferns? No, they are more closely related to conifers than they are to ferns. They're very definitely in the uh, seed plant side of the equation. And there's, we, we call them seed ferns, there's seven or eight different large um, families, even orders of, seed ferns that we toss into this. We call it a garbage basket taxon or name because so many different um, things are thrown into it. But they are more closely related to conifers and flowers than they are to ferns. Well, uh, oh, no, that's it. So that's the last question we have. Um, Patrick, you wanna finish this off? Yeah, um, so I, I really appreciated, Rick, what you said that flowering plants are very good at manipulating animals to do what they need them to do. Yes. I, I paraphrase that, but man, that <laughs> we've got almost what over 400 million years of evolution here. And as, as the current caretakers of the planet, we're still being manipulated by the flowering plants and it, it, time time goes on. Um, the other thing to uh, re-emphasize, as you said, without the flowering plants, it's much drier and much warmer. And that's something for all of us to keep in mind. And as we're changing of this uh, vegetation and certainly with the Native Plant Society and those that are interested in, in this webinar, it leads into our next webinar. We're gonna take December and January off for the holidays. So in these crazy times where everything's wrong, we've got the pandemic, we've got the election, we've got the, the division of everything in the country and the state, it's time to take a couple of months 
sit back and appreciate what we have, take the holidays off. We will reconvene the, the webinar series in February, the first Thursday of February, and it will be given by Kevin Mink, who is an urban soil health specialist with the Oklahoma County Conservation District. Although it's Oklahoma County, I would encourage all to consider this. He's going to talk about their yard by yard program. And one of the things that uh, was mentioned that with the ongoing challenges related to hosting workshops because of COVID, the yard by yard project has become a way for citizens to actively participate and showcase their conservation activities while providing content on to share for educational purposes. The Yard by Yard um, program is essentially encouraging citizens, and it started in Oklahoma County and extended to Tulsa County next year in 21. They're talking about extending it across the state. So all of the Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts will hopefully be jumping on board with this. But if you do it, it's essentially recognizing native plants are important. I'm going to mow less, maybe have less grass and less invasives, and perhaps put in pollinator garden. And in doing so, you can gain notoriety amongst your neighbors. Uh, you can have a sign that says yard by yard. It, it's a really cool program that I think that a lot of the audience that's listening to this program will certainly uh, find helpful and something to think about in those early February cold, dreary days when you're thinking about getting out and doing something in the spring. Rick, if, or uh, Adam, if we don't have any other comments, we'll close by again appreciating Dr. Lupia for taking the time and the effort and the energy to put in a fabulous presentation for us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to do it. Okay. I think with that, we will adjourn. Thank you.